Hi everyone. I'm Professor Teng Sakhan Janapur. You can call me Golf. I'm a professor of medicine and director of Center of Excellence in Kidney Metabolic Disorders, Faculty of Medicine, Chulangon University. I serve as chair of the advisory board of PD and Nephrology Society of Thailand, as well as the representative of developing nations of the Creed Steering Committee, International Standing Committee for the PDOPS, Editorial Board of the PDI, and Jupiter Editor of ISPDAPC Newsletter. Today, I pride myself on being able to moderate this important session, Physical Activity and Exercise Guidelines for Patients on PD, Practical Points to Guide Patients. This session is supported by ISPD. We have more than 250 audience pre-register from different professions. Let me briefly introduce the, these new ISPD guidelines. As we all know that physical activity and working activity can improve both physical, physiological and mental health in PD patients, but there was only spare information on how to do exercise safely Well design process and robust work of the Global Renal Exercise Network, or GREG. A practical recommendation on physical activity and exercise in PD was published in PDI. There were four main categories of recommendations include, first, timely timing of physical activity. Second, specific activities. Third, symptom and side effects. Fourth, nutrition and fitness. The strength of each recommendation is indicated as either level one recommend, recommend or level two suggest. Today we have four renowned speakers who are experts in exercise in PD and led the guidelines. They have different professions, including nephrologists, exercise specialists, PD nurse, and PD patient. They will summarize these valuable recommendations and respond to all your questions. Should you have any questions, please text into the chat box. I will ask the speakers to respond to all of your questions. If the time is not available to respond to all of your questions, we will email back to you. Please leave your email address in the box. Let's move to the topics. Start first with Professor Paul Bennett. Paul needs no introduction. You can read Paul's bio in the webinar program. Paul Bennett is a professor at the University of South Australia and research director at Satellite Healthcare San Jose, San Jose, USA. Paul focuses on pragmatic clinical research strategies to improve the quality of life of people with kidney diseases. Most recently, Paul led the development of the ISP GREG guideline. Today, he will provide information to assist people on PD and clinicians, especially PD nephrologists, on what people on PD can do, not what they cannot do. When it comes to physical activity, the PD physical activity recommendations around swimming, bigger sports, and obesity will be covered. Paul, please. Thank you so much, Golf. It's uh, a great introduction. Uh, you can hear me, yeah? Yes. Fantastic. So like Golf said, we're going to cover the 2022 physical activity and exercise in peritoneal dialysis practice recommendations on behalf of the whole team that's uh, involved in this. I'm speaking from Adelaide, Australia. This is what we see with our peritoneal dialysis patients. We see them coming in, uh, they start dialysis, they've had symptoms and um, they start feeling a bit better and they're great. They feel independent, they're fantastic. Over a period of time with both our peritoneal and our hemodialysis patients, this is what happens and we see them uh, physically deteriorate in particular, a lot quicker than what we all normally physically deteriorate. And they end up often uh, in with frames, with chairs and on a brush. And a 
course, uh, they can't do peritoneal dialysis if they're not physically independent. We know that uh, people on PD are relatively inactive. Um, the red line that you can see is the uh, recommended 10,000 steps. Uh, peritoneal dialysis patients over on the left uh, range between uh, 3,000 to 4,000 um, when we've measured people's um, step counts in research projects. Similarly, hemodialysis patients are low in comparison to the kidney transplant group uh, on the right-hand side who almost reach 10,000 steps after they're transplanted. Perineal dialysis studies are shown on the left there. And we also know that, um, that PD patients, equi they're equivalent uh, to approximately 20 years older. So a 50 year old on PD, uh, their average physical equivalence is equivalent to that of a, a 70 year old, which is ironic because we teach people on PD to, uh, to be independent, to do their PD. Uh, however, we send them home with these bags, with these boxes and bags and heavy boxes, and we expect them to do all sorts of things. And if any of you have been in a PD patient's home, you know that these boxes are bound and they're forever moving them around as well as other equipment. So we make them independent, yes, we forget about sometimes their physical activity. So do people on peritoneal dialysis want to exercise? Well, the answer is yes. Um, we did some studies and this is what really uh, generated some of these guidelines is some of the work that, that have been done around the world. But it's certainly we know that um, people on PD do want to exercise. And this is an example of that. Perfect. Good job. Awesome. All right, let's do one more. And good. Good job. So what you're looking at is a, a PD patient in a, in a clinic uh, doing very cheaply run bicep curls and also core exercises with an exercise physiologist. Very capable of doing this. And in fact, most PD patients can do some sort of exercise. We know that exercise is all about behaviour change, going from the couch to the track, so to speak, uh, and we know behaviour change is important, and it's not just guidelines, but however guidelines help. Um, behaviour change is a, is a complex issue. Um, we've used the behaviour change model in the past to capture both the factors that affect behaviours and the different types of interventions that can be used to change behaviours. So this is an example of how, of how we can model our behaviour change, and the behaviour change will basically a synthesis of, 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 previous, not of previous models of behavior change and drawn from a large evidence base. And you can see the three concentric circles. In the green, you've got the sources of behavior. In the red, we have the interventions that we do. However, in the gray are sometimes the forgotten areas, which are the policy areas. And if no matter how great we think we are in intervening in exercise with our PD patients or with our hemo patients, we sometimes forget about the policy categories. And, this, and certainly um, if we have a patient like who's had a TheraBand in the middle there, that's fine but we often forget about the guidelines. And if as clinicians, we don't have guidelines, then we often don't know what we're doing. And in particular, um, uh, we, we as nephrologists and PD nurses um, aren't exercise specialists. So we don't have a physical, or we didn't have physical activity guidelines for peritoneal dialysis. So we needed some supermen to come in and these supermen were the International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis and the Global Renal Exercise Network who got together to develop these guidelines. The guideline development is always a tricky procedure. What happened in these guidelines that we recruited exercise experts and nephrology experts. The experts were all experienced in PD exercise programs. So uh, we didn't just get people who were PD people or we didn't get people who were just exercise people. This included nephrologists, exercise professional, dietitians, nurses and researchers. And research. We had four broad groups of people, four broad groups of, of areas and 16 section topic subgroups. Very importantly, people on PD and section teams develop questions from the PD consumer's perspective. So we, we questioned these from the, from the actual patient, so the patient questions that we're asking. And practice points were developed addressing each of the 16 sections. These were evidence interrogated and the grade criteria applied. 
At each step, we were reviewed and approved by cons our consumer members or our patient partners, because that's the most important person in our, in our development. And at the end, we had an independent review by a broader ISPD and GRX guidelines group. Just as a reminder, the GRADE criteria uh, stands for Grading of Recommendations, Assessment, Development and Evaluations. And we looked at the strength of each recommendation, where is a level one, which is a strong recommendation or a level two suggestion. Now, most of ours are suggestions because the strength is, is low. The certainty of the supporting evidence goes from A to D, uh, high certainty, which is meta-analysis, randomized control trials, B, moderate certainty, low certainty and very low certainty. And again, these studies are, uh, um, um, are less than perfect, and most of our recommendations and suggestions are unfortunately uh, C and D. So we presented it with a patient question, for example, can I swim? Uh, then we had a rationale behind that, why is this question important? That came from the patient and the clinicians. Uh, what is the evidence? So we interrogated the evidence through literature review. The, we then developed clinical practice points to guide clinicians, which is vital. Uh, and then, of course, we had future research questions. And a consumer uh, had input in each of these stages, which was vital for, for, uh, to keep us on track to make sure that we were asking the right questions that um, patients on PD actually do do. And what turned out were four sections. And I'll go through these very briefly and then focus on a couple. We looked at the timing of physical activity, particularly physical activity around catheter insertion time. We looked at whether uh, exercise should be done uh, empty or dry. So we looked at whether the volume of intra-abdominal fluid recommended during physical activity uh, is necessary or not. Some of the specific activities that patients uh, talk about and are worried about are clearly swimming and water sports, contact sports and sports requiring vigorous activity. Uh, certainly there's the question around core strength and what we should we do given there's a catheter in someone's tummy. Uh, areas around work, both, um, uh, both manual work and also desk work. Uh, it was very important um, that we address some of the areas around sexual activity and sexual dysfunction when it comes to activity as well. Some of the symptoms and side effects that are commonly felt that, that really affect physical activity included um, exit site care, uh, the problem around perspiration, and is that an issue? Uh, cardiovascularly compromised individuals, what sort of exercise can they do? What sort of exercise can the frail do? What do we do about people who are fatigued and how do we get around that when it comes to exercise? And also some of the areas of, around mental health and exercise. And we had a section, although we weren't focused on nutrition because that's not what our expertise was, we certainly had some expert dietitians involved in exercise programs who could talk on dietary practice points, uh, the issue of obesity, particularly important in PD patients, and also the issue of people who have come in on a low base fitness level. I'll touch on the swimming and water sports section at the, uh, to start off with. So this is how, uh, this is to give an example of what the uh, guidelines look like. So the question was from the perspective of the person living with PD. So the questions that we asked in swimming was, what do I need to consider if I want to go swimming or engage in activities involving water? Second question, how do I use a colostomy bag to protect my exit site and catheter because the use of colostomy bag is getting, is getting more and more frequent? And do clear waterproof dressings or colostomy bags reduce the risk of infection? The question rationale was clearly the presence of a peritoneal dialysis catheter presents the question of whether engaging in water sports, in particular swimming, places people receiving PD at increased risk, increased risk of infection. And also um, uh, as PD clinicians, clinicians, we should be able to provide um, some guidance around swimming. So what was the evidence? Uh, evidence is not strong as usual. So exercise infections or peritonitis are rarely reported in those who swim. It's common practice to have appropriate perfection for the protection for the catheter and exit site during bathing or swimming. European and other world countries allow bathing, swimming and saunas, so all water sport uh, associated exercise. Swimming or saunas can contribute significantly to improved quality of life in many dialysis patients. Many of our dialysis patients do want to keep, keep swimming as it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a great sport for them. Uh, in a survey of Australian PD nurses, 85% um, recommend swimming safe in private pools with 90% recommend safety in seawater as long as protocols are adhered to. 
And finally, swimming can be safe in lakes and public pools if strict pre and post exercise care are adhered to. Clearly, these are not highly powered randomised controlled trials. These are surveys, etc. The practice points that we developed out of this was that swimming or water sports should preferably take place in either seawater or swimming pools that are known to be well maintained, whether they be private or municipal, because we know that um, they can be maintained in, in different ways. But of course, the grade levelling is 2D, which we suggest uh, with a low level of certainty. We, we recommend avoid swimming in open water directly after storms. A clear waterproof dressing or colostomy bag can assist the catheter and exit site from getting wet. And the strongest recommendation was we recommend that routine exit site care should be performed after swimming and water sports, which is common sense, but it's still something that we can, we can um, assist the patients with. So the research question, is there a significant association between water activities, exercise infection and or peritonitis has never been answered. Uh, so that's uh, one of the future research questions that we had in this section. I'll just roughly uh, talk about the practice points for another area, contact sports and, and sports requiring vigorous activity. Contact sports where there is risk of physical trauma or repetitive rubbing occurring to catheter sites are not recommended. Sports that require frequent bending, squatting or lifting may be best done without PD fluid in situ. The use of a PD belt during sports may provide enhanced protection. And patients may need to temporarily modify or cease their sporting activities if the PD fluid becomes blood or red tinged. Some obesity practice points. We know that physical activity and exercise are safe in obese individuals and should be recommended. Considering performing, performing low impact exercises such as swimming, cycling, and exercise is an effective adjunctive therapy for weight management and weight loss, particularly with supervised specialized dietitian and exercise professional. So this was our go at doing a PD exercise guidelines summary. It's just a start. Um, these practice points are a start and hopefully they will create more conversation and potentially more research. The evidence is limited, we know, which is pretty much uh, what we always find when we do a guideline development. Uh, global surveys will assist and we're currently doing a patient and a staff survey, clinician survey, and that will help us uh, learn more and potentially, uh, potentially build on these guidelines. But our ultimate objective, of course, is to have people who uh, are on PD doing normal daily activities. This is an example of Rob from Darwin in Northern Australia uh, catching a barramundi, and you can see he's also doing his perineal dialysis. Thank you very much. Thank Paul for your fantastic summary. So uh, let me move to the next speakers. Uh, and let me leave to you what Stephanie Bio. Stephanie Thompson is an assistant professor of nephrology at the University of Alberta, Canada, and the medical lead of the kidney exercise program in Northern Alberta. Her research focuses on examining the effect of exercise interventions on frailty and vascular diseases. She will use 15, uh, 12 minutes, cover the role of the nephrologist in the PD exercise program, focusing on reframing advice to emphasize what can be done and recognizing where exercise has a therapeutic role. Uh, Stephanie, please. Thank you, Paul. Thanks mind. for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, the role of the nephrologist in a successful PD exercise program. And I also want that to include the role of the nephrologist um, in any PD program. But before I uh, launch into that, just building on what uh, Paul talked about, I want to establish some common ground because we don't claim that these recommendations are based on state of the science evidence. We can appreciate that though, I think as PD clinicians, what it's like to make clinical decisions based on uncertain evidence. But this uh, set of recommendations is born out of patient priorities to maintain physical function and also life participation. And also with the understanding that, um, that there are potential benefits of exercise. And so we want to use this as a guide for being able to speak to patients with the same sort of qualified uh, certainty that we do with respect to other clinical matters. So what is the role of a nephrologist in exercise program? 
Um, I didn't catch how many uh, nephrologists were attending today. Um, I think that if you're here, maybe you've self-selected as a uh, person who is interested in exercise. But I wanted to gear the segment of the talk towards somebody who's not particularly interested in exercise and certainly doesn't have any um, specific knowledge or background. Because, um, you know, to be fair, nephrologists are not exercise specialists. They are not exercise specialists and nor are they expected to be. So um, I think it's helpful to de declare what I think their role is. And so to do this, I did ask uh, my colleagues, I work with uh, a good number of uh, very dedicated PD clinicians in our unit. And, you know, it is consistent with what I've heard over the years in terms of the nephrologist's role, which I would summarize is not to get in the way of it with respect to an exercise program. So it's an interesting statement, it's a direct quote, but it does summarize the sentiment, I think quite well, certainly from uh, our program and other uh, programs in Canada. But I do wanna talk a little bit about what exactly that means not to get in the way of an exercise program. I like, uh, I like this cartoon depicted here. Uh, when I look at it, I see two physicians discussing this sign. And I think that it's really relevant because physicians and particularly the physicians I know as nephrologists, we do tend to be quite measured in terms of the advice we give and conservative and particularly when it comes to things that we don't have a lot of experience with or we're not familiar with. And that is the case for exercise. So what I think not getting in the way means as a nephrologist is that nephrologists can actually try to reframe the advice that they give to emphasize what can be done. And this builds a little bit on uh, Paul's talk. And I'm going to introduce that with respect to our recommendations in two areas, uh, lifting uh, and also exit site care. Second, I think we have to recognize where exercise can have a therapeutic role. This is very different from saying, oh yeah, everybody should exercise. Exercise good, that's what you do in your leisure time. It's different than to say, this is actually part of your medical management. And so I wanna talk about frailty and where it is appropriate to introduce that concept into the medical management of a PD patient. Finally, um, I wanna talk about number three, just only briefly. And that is, I think we should recognize that most of the time physicians do have some sway in terms of being able to advocate with their renal programs for what resources are needed. And we have to acknowledge uh, the necessity of having a dedicated exercise specialist for a successful program. And the role of the nephrologist is to uh, support those if they think it is appropriate for their program. So um, let's talk about the recommendation on the types of activities with PD fluid in. So most programs have lifting restrictions. I know that ours in Canada does, and certainly ours in Alberta is 25 pounds. So as nephrologists, we're very comfortable telling patients what they can't do when they ask, you know, what can I do? We say, just don't lift every, anything over 25 pounds. And so I think that that's really appropriate if this is your average patient. Okay, so this is a 78 year old powerlifting lady who's lifting 245 pounds. And so if that's your average patient, sure, you can keep reiterating that you shouldn't lift anything more than 25 pounds. But actually in Canada anyway, this is more of our accurate patient population. And these are the type of activities I think that people could be interested in doing. So walking, jogging, hiking. But when we always default to what you can't do, we really do miss an opportunity to talk to patients about activity. And it's interesting that we're so comfortable with that lifting restriction, given that it is based on very uncertain evidence. So uh, in terms of what we recommend about exercise and fluid volumes, I think most of us appreciate the first several points here that intra-abdominal pressure will vary according to body position. What I do wanna focus on is the last two. Uh, so the type of exercise affects intra-abdominal pressure differently. And we think it's lowest with walking and jogging and highest with weightlifting and jumping. There is no uh, consistent correlation uh, between PD fluid volume and subsequent risk of hernia and, and leaks. I will say that that evidence uh, base is uncertain as well. It is retrospective case control. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, what we then decided for a practice point is that activities that are associated with low intra-abdominal pressure, like walking, hiking, um, and jogging, do not require the patient to be empty. 
And that's very important because it is quite an extra burden to then adjust your PD treatment to an extra exchange around your activity. That's another potential barrier. But certainly for activities such as weightlifting and snow shoveling and heavier impact activities, we do recommend that the patient uh, drain the abdomen. Next, in terms of reframing our advice, uh, we, the question here is with respect to exit care and exercise, primarily infection, because that is what we spend a lot of time talking to our patients to prevent. So the bottom line is we don't know what the risk of infection is uh, with exercise. You can imagine that there are several factors with exercise that may promote infection. For example, catheter movement or trauma, excessive movement has been associated with a higher risk of infection. We don't know about perspiration um, or micro trauma, perhaps from friction from vigorous activity. But you know, I think it's also important to consider what about improved glycemic control? So we know that poor glycemic control is associated with higher catheter um, uh, infections. And from non-dialysis diabetic populations, from trials, we know that exercise can improve glucose control. So perhaps some of these potential benefits could balance some of these potential risks. Along the same lines, what about weight control? There is the association between elevated BMI and PD patients and a higher risk of infection. Now, whether that's causal or not is arguable. But you can sort of imagine perhaps if exercise could improve weight control, we don't know that yet, but if it could, um, could it also uh, offset some of these other potential risks? So in terms of recommendations, what we uh, decided was for exit site care and exercise that um, a non-occlusive gauze type dressing would be appropriate. And that's the balance between allowing enough um, air to circulate around the uh, site, but also protecting it from potential friction from vigorous activity. The stronger recommendations are with respect to wearing breathable and freshly laundered clothing, and that the exit site should be cleaned. And those are, as again, common sense, consistent with previous guideline recommendations. Um, it is important to note um, when discussing with the patient to recommend that they secure their catheter well when they engage in exercise. And that's just what I've depicted in that diagram as excessive uh, movement or trauma can increase the risk of infection as we know from observational studies. Finally, I want to talk about where exercise has a potential therapeutic role in our management of patients. We know that frailty is a problem in our population, three to seven times higher than the general population, and it's associated with poor health outcomes. Relevant to PD, though, uh, it can predict technique failure and death. So understanding or having a picture of a patient's frailty status can be used to inform some of the discussion around goals of care, going forward for transplant and so on. Also management. Um, so even the frailest adults, and this is an important point, can do something. They may never amass the 150 minutes a week, but they can still benefit in terms of being able to improve measures of physical function with exercise. And that has been demonstrated in trials across a range of populations in the elderly, other chronic conditions. And I'll just draw your attention to that Cochrane uh, review that was just published recently, primarily studies in um, hemodialysis patients, but did show that exercise can improve uh, measures of physical function. That's my point about management. So what do we uh, recommend? So first, uh, we do recommend frailty assessment given its role in prognostication. We do suggest some uh, frailty assessment tools there. We do not know which was the best one and that it can be informed by your center, the expertise and the feasibility in the clinical setting. Um, there's higher level, uh, level evidence to support physical function testing. These are the measures we're trying to improve. And we do suggest some cutoffs there. You can see uh, physical function tests to assess, uh, assess strength, sit to stand, time up and go, gait speed. And there are cutoffs there. So um, sit to stand if you can't do that five times um, in under 10 seconds, you are higher risk for disability. So these are important things that can be measured at baseline and then after intervention. 
So with respect to management, uh, physical activity and or exercise training programs can prevent or mitigate physical frailty and reduce the risk of disability. That is a recommendation with moderate certainty, given the trial evidence, as I spoke about earlier. We don't know which kind of exercise is best, um, but given that the population is debilitated, Usually um, people can benefit from any type of exercise. Gains in strength can be made with aerobic if somebody is uh, quite debilitated. See, the important point is that um, everybody can do something, even the frailest patients. So really just uh, quickly in summary, what I've talked about is that we need to reframe our advice to meet the functional needs of the patient in front of us. We also though, uh, as a research gap, have to address the needs of this gentleman in the red suit. So he's the one who wants to keep working doing heavy lifting with a dwell inside his abdomen. So more research needs to be done about that in terms of the risk of me mechanical complications. I see myself freezing, anyhow. Um, uh, and I've also talked about exit site care, which follows from the ISPD recommendations with an emphasis on securing the catheter and perhaps using gauze to reduce friction. And finally, uh, we can recommend frailty assessment. Uh, it is an outcome that can be managed. And for future directions, we suggest also understanding how um, improving measures of physical function relates to uh, decreasing the risk of technique failure. And with that, I will unshare my screen. Thanks, Stephanie. A wonderful talk. I really love your picture, patient living with and wonderful super ladies. <laughs> okay, let's move to uh, patient view. Uh, Nikki, uh, Nicole Robinson or Nikki is a patient partner, physiotherapist, and third year PhD candidate at the Sydney School of Public Health. The University of Sydney. In 2014, Nikki was on PD and has subsequently received a living donor kidney transplant from her brother. Nikki has given several invite, invited presentations, including WCN 2019 and ASN 2020. Nikki is the con consumer editor of Crocran Kidney and Transplant and Stealing Club member of the song GN and Australasian Kidney Trial Network. Today, she will talk about patients' perspectives, especially, especially uh, sexual activity and dysfunction and daily work. Please give a special welcome to Nikki. We are all looking forward to hear you, Nikki, please. Thanks, Scott, so much for having us. Um, just a, bit, a brief background, as um, Gov has said, of, um, started PD in 2014, and I was lucky enough to receive a living donor transplant. Um, I was very lucky to have a very supportive family, um, but also I live rurally. So for me to go to my training centre was about an hour and a half one way to drive, and it was six hours to my transplant centre, um, which had a few ramifications um, for us. I loved being on PD. Um, PD was my cheap treatment of choice. Um, I was on it for eight months. I stayed on um, CAPD. I um, initially was very unwell when I first uh, started PD and felt very unfit. I'd been a treating physiotherapist for a long time, so active and busy. And then following a bout of a few illnesses in a row, I had become really um, physically unfit. Um, I started walking as per a cardiac rehab program because I'd been a physio for a while and then gradually built up, but there were quite a few bumps and hurdles in the road. A big saving grace for me was Park Run where I started um, and I really enjoyed that. The photos here are actually with me um, while I was on PD, so I had much shorter hair. Um, the top ones with my children um, who were all teenagers at the time at the beach and so we'd often go swimming. Um, I also loved doing part run, which is down the bottom here. And we adapted. Um, my husband thankfully built me raised garden beds so that I didn't have to bend over all the time. I also needed to lose five kilos, which was really important as well um, for my transplant. For me, um, being involved in Greg's guidelines was um, really, really important. 
up here in the top photo is actually me with my candle up where my PD bag hung. And unfortunately, one of the side effects for me was um, my skin. I have really fragile skin in a lot of ways. Um, and the dressings were hard. And I'd only wear a dressing when I was actually um, exercising. So my skin, because I had a lot of allergies to it. But I think the Grex guidelines is vitally important um, to us. And not only does it highlight um, where there are huge areas of, of data missing and information missing, but there's a genuine fear out there in the community. I live in a rural um, community where we, we actually didn't have a nephrologist um, here at that stage. And all the treating general practitioners, um, the non-PD um, nurses that I came involved with, allied health staff, other physios, they really didn't know what to do regarding exercise for us. And there was lots of questions. And I think very much like Stephanie said, we often get told what we can't do, not actually what we can do. And I remember two things stayed in my mind that I wasn't allowed to do it was to lift more than 10 kilos. Um, and then I was flabbergasted that the Baxter boxes were 12. And it was like, well, how does that work? And um, the other one was just around exercising and the risk of infection around my exit site. I think the inclusion of sexual activity and sexual dysfunction was really, really important. And I was really lucky to work on this with an amazing um, nurse from remote Queensland, Leanne Brown. And I think this is a part of us as, um, as patients that often gets overlooked and, and not um, addressed. And often some people feel very uncomfortable, both patients and staff looking after us to actually discuss this. And I guess I've got the recommendations and, and all that information here, but I guess what I wanted to talk about was from the patient's perspective a little bit more at the moment. Our fatigue is a huge impact um, on our um, ability to, uh, I guess, expel energy in all ways. And it's often around having to kind of save and conserve energy and Combine this with our impacts on our body image, having a tube, um, I received multiple new scars that I hadn't had uh, previously or long starting. Um, it all has a huge impact on our relationships. I think it changes. And if, if prior to starting peritoneal dialysis, we have some concerns about how our body looks or we feel unconfident, sometimes having that tube and, and going through dialysis actually can be a tipping point to where it actually becomes a much bigger issue. And I, I suspect it's really important in patients to actually deal with some of those issues and ask them about how they're feeling about themselves. I think the other thing too around sexual activity is that a lot of the time people are touching us, we're receiving um, tubes being put in fistulas, we're having IV drips, we're having blood taken, we feel particularly unwell. A lot of touch is actually around pain or having medical procedures done to us at that time. Um, and that is something that I really struggled with, with people. Um, I felt a lot of pain. And, and one thing we, we didn't talk about was that often the taste of metallicness in our mouth actually changed um, how I felt about kissing um, my husband because of the taste in my mouth. And it did change our relationship from um, one of a more intimate to one of where he, I felt like often he was my carer. And it took quite a lot of work and quite a lot of communication for us to actually deal with some of those um, changes. And we've been married for 25 years when I started PD. There's a lot of anxiety from, a, um, from the patient's point of view around the tube. In infection, it's drilled into us about infection control, infection control. And we are concerned about um, how our tube should be when we are um, having, having sex. And um, I think it's really important. And I guess one thing I wanted people to take away, you can read the recommendations, but who is it in your team that has the talk, talks with the patients, talks with the care partners around um, how this is going to go on to impact them or any concerns they have? Because sex and sexuality um, is a huge part of, of who we are as people and we, we need to not avoid this. The other one I wanted to talk about was work. And this was something that was really important to me. I've always worked um, and it, it helps us all um, financially, but socially work is a huge part of, of what we do. It's also emotionally, a lot of us have our work families as well as our, um, our normal families. But 
one of the things that's really tricky when you're looking at work and particularly as a physio I had quite physical work like some of the uh, not as heavy as some of the laborers but certainly for me I was an active treating physio with hands-on and I often treated um, very dependent stroke patients who I'd be transferring who are quite dependent um, and some of them quite heavy how to approach that was it was a really tricky thing and it's actually um, needing to be one of the biggest barriers was actually needing to be work fit so for me it was about activating my core I've been a physio for a long time I engaged my core for my all my lifting all my transfers all the work that I did but there was very little information out there around how to be fit for work and engage in core so that I could actually do the functional things not alone just picking up my life was more than just picking up backs to boxes to get ready for my next exchange. It was also vital for me to actually be treating people as well. I think one of the biggest areas around um, it all too for work was around the brain fog and actually making um, decisions about how to get work fit without guidance and that I had to problem solve and work through, which I had the skills to do as a physio, but sometimes it was, I felt so unwell, I couldn't actually do that. And I think the difficulty in some of this stuff is that we ha I had to learn to listen to my body. If it was a day where I wasn't feeling as well, I couldn't lift as much, I couldn't do as much. And, and having to really learn to listen to my body and to moderate things. But I think, it is really important that work is dealt with and that around um, functional exercises, which I know Chris is going to be talking about the exercise part, but I think exercise is targeted at the types of work that patients are doing. And these may be varied and, and people who are sedentary, maybe they just need to be getting up more to do things. So I think work is vitally important. And particularly we know that some of our, some patients go on to financially significantly struggle following dialysis and may never return to work. And there's some significant consequences for that as we go forward. I guess for me, I just want to end on a, a positive note in that, you know, I had to change some of my exercise to what I was doing. I was big into team sports and um, lots of hockey. I was a hockey goalie. Um, and so we kind of had to change some of those things. And, and I guess to me, it was about finding my groove. It's about helping patients to find how they love to exercise safely. For me, that's walking. I love to walk. Um, we walk most mornings four to five kilometres and we plan to do big walks and we still do park run. But I think exercise is a really vital part. Not only does it impact how we feel as patients, it helps us with our transplants or our treatment. It helps us to feel better, helps us to socialise. But I think also too, um, it helps us with our body image um, and feeling positive and strong. And I'd just like to say thank you so much uh, to ISPD for having us, Grex, and also to my living donor, because um, yeah, he's pretty special too. Thank you. Wonderful and fantastic talk and inspire patient and also us. Uh, so the next, the last speaker today is uh, uh, Krista Stewart. Even uh, I have, have not been, uh, I have never met Krista, but I'm sure she will be great. Krista Stewart has a Master of Science in Kinesiology and is a certified exercise physiologist to the Canada Society for Exercise Physiology. She is currently the fitness and wellness coordinator for the Manitoba Renal Program in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, where she is dedicated to improving the, the, the life of people with chronic kidney disease. She will cover how to run an exercise program, highlighting low baseline fitness levels, core strength, and mental health from the PD recommendation. Please stop, please. Great, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, it's okay. Yes, great. So yes, my name is Krista. I'm a kinesiologist and I'm the fitness and wellness coordinator for the Manitoba Renal Program. And I just wanted to start off by talking about our program and how we began. Um, it was actually um, patient initiated. So the woman that you see on the screen, her name is Beverly. And she saw the need for people um, that, to exercise. She felt that it was missing for dialysis patients and she advocated for herself and other patients to get active. 
So Dr. Clara Bohm jumped on board right away and uh, she did a pilot exercise study in 2006. And seeing that it was feasible, we uh, had a formal position created in 2007. And two of the main initiatives that we do are the biking during dia hemodialysis and then also an um, exercise program that I'm gonna be talking about that is outside of dialysis. We originally called it Lean King Kidney Machines and uh, more recently have changed the program and uh, have called, now call it Kidney Fit Class. So a little bit about our program. So it's a 10 week education and exercise program and it's open for people in all stages of chronic kidney disease. We have many people that come through that um, have, are on peritoneal dialysis. Participants are cleared by their physician prior to, to coming. And um, we operated out of two medical fitness facilities in Winnipeg, but it doesn't need to be there. When we started, we were in the auditorium of the hospital. So you just need a space. Um, we welcome family members and as supports and uh, generally run it four sessions per year. However, for the past two years, we've been running it virtually because of COVID-19. So as I said, we, have, we run education and exercise. So the first hour usually is education and we have different professionals that come in and do presentations. So this uh, is a picture of one of our um, nurses that, that came in. We also have pharmacy, dietitians, social work, and many other. And then the second um, hour we do exercise, of course. And so we'll start off with um, cardiovascular exercise and Generally, the uh, participant would choose what they like to do. So you can see in the pictures, lots of variety, or we may do it as a group. We do resistance training exercises again, which may be in a group, or if they've learned the equipment, they're doing it individually as well. And then we always end off with balance and stretching. According to the World Health Organization, um, it's suggested to build up to 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity uh, aerobic activity, which would be equivalent to about 30 to 60 minutes uh, five times a week, or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous intensity or a combination of them both for aerobic activity. For muscle strengthening, it's suggested to strengthen all the major muscle groups um, two days or more per week at a moderate or greater intensity and also uh, including balance three or more days a week. And older adults should include balance and strengthening exercises to enhance functional capacity and help to prevent risk of falls. So many of our people that come to our program are coming in with a low fitness level. And so what's really important is to start where that participant is at. So individualizing the exercises for their level, everything, every exercise can be modified and to encourage them to take rests when, they're, when needed. To steadily and gradually increase the frequency, intensity, and time spent exercising. So start with a low intensity, go slow, build gradually and, um, and consistently. Shorter bouts several times a day may be easier at first and they still get benefit from them. And the biggest thing is I think all of us know from exercising is consistency is key. So doing it on a regular basis. So building that foundation and building off of that on a regular basis is how we're gonna to continue to um, strengthen and grow. So looking specifically at core exercises for peritoneal dialysis, they are recommended as they can support intra-abdominal pressure secondary to PD fluid, potentially reducing hernia risk. Um, can help to support low back and prevent or manage low back pain. And it may be safest to strengthen in the supine position or, of course, in the, on your back laying down. And so the picture that's on the screen is of someone doing uh, exercise called a dead bug where you're alternating opposite arm with leg. So um, here's an, some more examples of exercises that, you, that would be safe for people to do on PD. So the first picture that you see on the left it, that person is actually engaging their transverse abdominis. And that's the deepest layer of abdominal muscles. And you activate that, so you can all try this now, by gently pulling your belly button in towards your back. And that contracts the, that deep layer of muscle. And when it does that, it acts like a girdle and helps to support the back. So while doing any exercises, especially strength training, but for sure with the core, it's important to engage that transverse abdominis first. 
And then you can see in the picture in the middle, she's engaging that transverse abdominis and then doing a leg lift. And, um, and then also um, the far right, it doing a modified plank on the wall, again, engaging that transverse abdominis. A little bit about mental health, um, which is always so important, and especially in these last couple of years. But 20 to 30 minutes of exercise three to five times a week is likely to improve or maintain mental health and including symptoms of anxiety and depression. And I wanted to um, talk more also from a lived experience, of course, running this program and talk about the power of the group. When our participants, uh, participants come, they say they like it because, of course, it helps to keep them accountable. We all know that if we have a place and time that we're expected to be at to exercise, it's more likely to happen. Um, but they also say that they feel supported and seen. And being able to connect with somebody who's going through the same thing that you are is, is invaluable. And, and it's huge. Um, it becomes like a family. People become friends. They even exchange phone numbers on their own. And uh, everyone's looking out for each other. So it's a really positive environment. In the education portion, um, we of course have a talk from the nurse and she will cover different mo modalities, including peritoneal dialysis. And uh, I've seen multiple times where we've had people in the group who have voluntarily offered to show the group their own uh, PD catheter, which again, is just something that is, uh, is incredible for, for people to see up close and personal. And a story that always sticks with me is um, about a woman named Anne. So Anne was coming to our exercise program and she brought a support person, her uh, daughter, and her name was Shirley. And during the course of the program, we knew that Anne was going to be leaving us to um, start peritoneal dialysis. So sure enough, that's what happened. And then she was able to rejoin us afterwards and start with some light walking and things like that. And later on in the fall, I was at a, um, a walk that the Kidney Foundation puts on. And I see Anne and Shirley there. And Shirley comes running over to me and she's like, Krista, Krista, I got to show you something. And she pulls out a couple of photos and this is what she shows me. And she told me that during the program, her mom was really scared about starting peritoneal dialysis. She was quite depressed about it. She was really feeling like life would be over, that it, it, it that she wouldn't be able to do anything. And I guess she expressed this to another participant, his name was Murray. And Murray at the time was on hemodialysis, but he had previously been on peritoneal dialysis. And he assured her that, he, that she'd be great. He told her all about the things that him and his brother did. They went fishing and camping and traveling. And again, just letting her know that she'd be fine. And Shirley told me that her mom thought, if Murray can do it, so can I, and she did. Here she is in, of course, dialyzing in the bush. And uh, she would tell me all of her travels. She went to the casino and all these other places. So it's pretty powerful. One last person I want to tell you about is this gentleman. His name's Dale Kalibaba. And uh, he's a PD patient uh, from Kamloops, British Columbia in Canada. And it was always Dale's dream to ride his bike across Canada. And um, in 2015, with the support of Baxter and also his coach, Shad Ireland, who happens to be the first dialysis patient to ever do a full Ironman, um, Dale realized his dream. So he um, rode from east to west coast and covered 6,821 kilometers and was able to, again, fulfill his dream. And he did it to, to promote or organ donor registration home modalities, and also to highlight the importance of staying active and physically fit, which a, a story I think is truly inspiring. So don't limit your patients, empower them, encourage them to take an active role in their health through exercise. As we know, so much of their lives is controlled through their dialysis schedule, through appointments, through their diet, on and on, but exercise gives them something that they can control and that something that they can do. So remember that anything is possible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kistra. Maybe I need your help for next time because I want to be a, another Iron Man. <laughs> uh. <laughs>
Thank to all speakers for your wonderful and concise talk. Now it's time to question and answer. Again, uh, if anyone of the audience have any questions regarding guidelines or want to share your opinions on the patient exercise, please text into the chat box. I will reach out to the speaker for addressing each of the, your questions. If the time is not available, we will respond to all of your questions via email. Please don't forget to leave your email address, address there. So uh, we have uh, now maybe five or four or five questions. Maybe. But let me start with, uh, because uh, Mikhail said we can extend our session to next 15 minutes. So we're gonna respond to all of the questions. Let's start first with uh, Louis from Kennedy. Louis Kennedy, sorry. Uh, should exercise be ceased or stopped if fluid in bags is pink or red in color? Even if the occurs in low impact exercise, maybe we will leave to this question to Stephanie. Stephanie, please help us answer this question. Thank you, Louise. Be happy to answer that. So physical activity is um, a known cause of having pink uh, tinged or hemoperitoneum, so blood in the peritoneal dialysis fluid. Um, you know, at the risk of dispensing medical advice. I'll tell you what I would do, though, um, as you know, if, if you were in my clinic, I would ascertain the relationship, make it very clear, is this really due to physical activity, making sure it's not other things we'd want to investigate further, and that's up to the clinician. But if it's very clearly related to physical activity, and there's no complicating factors, no pain, um, it's not clogging up your catheter, I would not recommend you to stop physical activity because you know this is something that can happen to people it can come and go for unknown reasons even after we can't find a cause so in and of itself if there's no other alarming signs or symptoms i would uh, i would support you in continuing your uh, exercise program thank you for your answer yeah i agree that we have to work out work out uh, the other cause that may cause the bloody dissect. So for the next question is uh, from, from pediatrics nephrologist from Bangalore. I think uh, this question I need to, uh, maybe Stephanie help me to respond that. What's, uh, what are your thoughts on initiating a renal exercise program for these children on PD or all state of CKD? Maybe Stephanie and also Krista help, help me to respond to this. This question. Yeah, I'll pull in Krista. I mean, to be honest, we we um, really, really need to promote this in the pediatric population. I'll see if Krista has got any experience. We do in our chemo program of people, uh, children on dialysis exercising, but uh, I'll defer to Krista for her experience if she has any. Yeah, I would, um, I would just say I think it's really important and um, unfortunately I don't have a lot of uh, experience working with children because I'm, I deal with the adult population, but absolutely I think it's very important to get children going because you're also setting up um, exercise as a, a, something they're doing lifelong and so if you, the earlier you start with that, the better it is for them. So absolutely I think that's an excellent idea. Yeah. And I think just to add to that, um, golf, um, working with kids, the case managers are usually their parents. And um, I think we have to um, allay the parents' fears uh, um, and get them to involve the kids and, and not make it uh, a, a sterile environment, but to be as normal as possible because kids will be active. We know that. And just to add to that, I, that's a really important point. It's really important, and that's why in our program we also have supporters or caregivers come with the people because, um, so especially for children, if their parents are active, they're also more likely to be active. So I think it's really important that, um, that they're engaged as well. Okay. Let me move to the next question. The next question is indicated for Krista. So one of the benefits of group exercise is the group interaction. Did this change when you went virtual because of this uh, COVID-19 era? How do you facilitate interaction between patients in a virtual setting? Um, so the, 
since we've gone virtual, we actually have um, Emily Ford, who is, happens to be the Grex uh, project manager. She wears many hats. She also is an, our instructor for Kidney Fit. So if Emily's actually on the call right now, I would love to for her to chime in. But one thing that's been helpful is before we went virtual, these people did have a bit of a relationship beforehand because we did it in person. And so um, I know that um, Emily will will carve out a little bit of time at the beginning and at the end to talk to people and um, to get everybody interacting. Um, of course, our programs had to be have to have been modified because of being virtual. Um, and so we're focusing a little bit more on the um, resistance training and also our education. We ended up putting, um, um, we, we've got it on something that they can watch so we don't do it live as much anymore. But uh, just curious, if, is Emily on the call right now? Because she'd be great to jump in on that. Maybe not. Um, so yeah, I think it's just just chatting with everybody and and uh, she's always checking in also with people in terms of making sure that how they're feeling as they exercise and whatnot. I hope that helps. Yeah, should be. So maybe uh, move to the next next question. I think uh, um, unknown uh, audience. So uh, his question is about should core exercise be performed with empty abdomen? Is it safe? to do crunches. I think Chris, Krista, you are hot. So people yeah. ask you again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Stephanie and Paul, of course, are welcome to chime in as well. Um, in the guidelines, I don't think there's anything that that talks specifically about doing crunches, but it's not something that we do uh, because there's a um, thought that there's a chance that the catheter could get uh, turned by doing the crunches. So we always do, um, core exercises with more of a, um, with the core in sort of a straight position. So like those examples that I showed where they're, you know, laying on your back and you're doing arm and leg movements or doing a modified plank, or even we've done ones where you're sitting on the edge of the chair and slowly leaning back just slightly and then coming back forward. So um, I wouldn't suggest doing crunches and I don't uh, do those with my patients, but I don't know if Stephanie and Paul have anything to add. Stephanie and Paul? I agree. Uh, agree. I agree, Krista. I agree. Okay. Um, the next question. I was is just going to add one thing to it about the core. People do think of crunches, and I never did them, Paul just said. Um, I stuck with pretty much what Chris is saying, but but also one of the key components of the core muscles is actually pelvic floor as well as a physio. Um, people do tend to forget that the pelvic floor is part of it. And for people going on to have a transplant, um, what you find is that they then start producing lots of urine and if they haven't actually had that good core and good pelvic floor muscles they do actually have some problems um, with continence issues and and while they're on pd so cores are um pelvic floor is a really good part of that as well thank thank nikki so i uh, move to the next question uh, from mary ross when is the earliest that an exercise program can be resumed after PD catheter insertion? Maybe Stephanie or Paul, can you respond to this question? I think we touched oh, on how that. Early. Yeah, how, how early to resume the yes, exercise? Yes, I think we after. do uh, touch on that in the recommendations. Typically four to six weeks post-insertion, if it's uncomplicated, is what our program recommends. Certainly six weeks with a history of diabetes. It's interesting, however, is that um, in some places around the world, um, they're now getting people on bikes, stationary bikes, the afternoon that or the day after they put catheters in. So soft aerobic uh, exercise can be done uh, to avoid sort of these um, post-op complications to a certain extent. So um, it depends on, on where you are and, and, and how safe you think you can do things in the supervisory, but clearly there are organisations and, and clinics who believe that um, exercise the day after, very low level exercise the day after the PD catheter insertion can be done. You can always walk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> I agree, you, you can walk. 
So for the next question, for Krista again, do you test the the patient's capacity before they start the exercise program? How do you evaluate strength test, balance test, or else? Yeah, we definitely um, we do uh, um, uh, start. We start off with an assessment, and then also end with an assessment at the very end of our program. And the things that we're looking at are height, weight, uh, date of birth, BMI. We do um, some questionnaires, the EQ5D, the good, good in leisure activity questionnaire. And then the physical tests we do um, are hand grip strength. We do a fix it, sort of like a balance, four meter walk, sit to stand uh, and shuttle walk. Um, so this will help to inform um, you know, the level that they're at. And then of course, after our 10 week program, then we redo these um, as well. Okay, now the question for Nikki. Did you design your training program yourself or did you get help? How, how did your exercise routine change after being transplanted? Um, thanks, look, yes. Thanks I for your sharing your story. <laughs> she said that. <laughs> um, I um, did design it myself because nobody else actually knew what to do. And when I was asking um, for support, I mean, this was obviously eight, seven, eight years ago. Um, there was very little guidance out there. Um, so, yeah, I basically went back to basics of being physio, which I was really, really lucky uh, to have that knowledge anyway and to be able to do it. I think um, it changed when I was transplanted. I, I thought after I got my transplant, I'd go straight back into um, playing team sports and some of the things being, you know, hockey. Um, unfortunately, I was a little bit more prone to injury, playing um, sort of things that required explosive. And so I did a calf, um, I ruptured an Achilles. Um, I had more injuries. I was a bit more injury prone. So I've kind of pulled things back a bit. And, uh, yeah, more now it's the Pilates and uh, lots and lots of walking. Um, we love bushes, bush walking and finding things like that. I Yeah, so it has changed because um, my body's changed and the impacts of the medications post-transplant, their impact can't be underestimated. But I think it's really important that we do weight-bearing activities throughout our whole um, cycle just with our bone health and things that go on, as we all know how important that can be in CKD patients. The next session is for, from Lily, maybe Malaysia, uh, as about the clinical question. And that's optimal hemoglobin level a criteria to allow an individual to exercise. Maybe Stephanie, can you respond to uh, the hemoglobin level? Maybe at least the lower threshold or maybe something like that. I'll take a pass at it. Um, we don't know is the, the bottom line. Um, and, you know, I think that, has, that was looked at in a study by Trish Painter a number of years ago. And I think the issue is that um, we can improve hemoglobin, but actually the gains in exercise or capacity um, are not what we would expect with that degree of improvement in anemia, suggesting that maybe it's not just your hemoglobin level, but then how that oxygen um, gets delivered to your muscles. So there are other issues. So it's not always just about your hemoglobin level in terms of how you feel when you exercise. So we don't recommend any higher hemoglobin if you wanna exercise. Um, that issue becomes uh, relevant if you are, um, you know, potentially performing at very high levels. Typically, uh, we would stick with what our programs, uh, you know, run for their anemia protocols, which is anywhere from 95 to 115. Now, that being said, I've had patients say to me, independent of exercise, that they feel better when their hemoglobin is X. And as long as it's not uh, above 115, 120, you know, I will individualize that for them. Um, but in and of itself, we don't think that necessarily improving your hemoglobin will lead to improve um, you know, aerobic fitness or ability to tolerate uh, the symptoms. The best thing for that is just to continue uh, with a regular program and the fitness will improve. And unfortunately, we don't have Lance Armstrong on the panel, so um, we don't have his perspective of how high your hemoglobin can actually get to improve your exercise capacity. So maybe the next question is uh, to maybe to Krista. What equip 
what equipment is needed to set up an exercise program ergometers uh, then dynamometers or pedal podometer i'm not familiar with this term okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you can collect well, it if you want <laughs> <laughs> the um, it, well, it definitely depends on a lot of things. Um, where are you exercising? Who are you exercising? Obviously, we're talking about peritoneal dialysis here. Um, but do you have a budget for equipment? Um, like I said, with our program um, for the exercise program, we started off in the auditorium of the hospital, and so there wasn't fancy equipment or anything. All we had was uh, Dynabands and um, some free weights. And I think that's a, a good point to make is you actually don't need a lot of things. You can, you can use your body weight to do exercise. You can use soup cans or milk jugs uh, that are filled with water or, um, or something at home. So there's a, a lot of things that you can do. So again, it just sort of depends our, our programs slowly morphed and, and we added more things as we went. But um, again, it, it just totally depends. Pedometers are helpful. Um, things like a dynonometer to do hand grip strength is, is, is helpful if that's something that you want to test for. So again, it's um, sorry, kind of a vague answer, but it just depends on what your needs are and what it is that you're trying to test for and uh, what are the needs of your participants. I'd just like to add, that's great, Krista, and I'd just like to add that probably Krista is the most important. So the actual exercise professional, having that person driving whatever exercise program you have rather than the equipment. And, and I'd just like to say that it's really important what Chris is saying about the use of cans and milk bottles that patients don't need to feel that they have to go and spend money. And, and like a lot of people I talk to, it's around having good footwear and maybe your clothes being comfortable to exercise in rather than spending lots of money and equipment that they may never use or um, do it properly. It's better to see someone and get the correct advice than to spend lots of money as a patient on having equipment at home. Yeah, because the time is coming up. Uh, I, ha I have to wrap up with the last questions from Edwina Brown. Uh, she said, great to see the guidelines fin finalists and published having been involved in their initiation. What are your plans for implementation? The guidelines are wonderful if access to wide multidisciplinary team, but that is not true for many PD units, or, and certainly not mine. Is there going to be follow-up to these guidelines to recommendation restaffing or access to kidney professionals? Otherwise, my usual statement that walking around the block, the, the block is, uh, is as important as doing a PD ex exchange will continue to fall on deaf ears. Uh, Paul, maybe you choose yeah, the Edwina, next person to Ed, respond to this one. Edwina, one of the wisest people in the world, thank you very much for those questions and comments. This is just the start really, and uh, we needed to have a baseline and we needed to get something out to put PD exercise and physical activity around. You're correct, a walk around the block is great. It's fantastic. Um, and if that's all that someone can do, then that's great. When uh, we talk about uh, the different levels of how do we change behavior, what's the best intervention, how do we um, inform policy um, and how do we inform large renal services, they're bigger questions, which we've addressed some of those in some of the work that the Global Renal Exercise Group has done, which is the main focus and the main mission. Um, and if people want to get involved in that, then just go to, uh, to the GREX website. Um, yes, it's a start. We've realised that there's way more research that needs to be done. And, um, and we're trying to promote that um, and uh, through the use of these guidelines. Um, so uh, thank you for those wise words. And We'll be working as hard as we can, but we have to also be doing this globally because we can only do a little bit in our own country, but we can do a lot together. And I think these guidelines are an example of that. Thank you all speakers for your contrib contribution and sincerely thank to the ISPD for supporting this valuable session. Last but not least, thank to the audience for your attention and for raising numerous questions before leaving the session, please help us have your opinions on this session and the ISPD great guideline by responding to the 
Google survey in the follow up email. So thank everyone and bye. Hope you enjoy this session and have a good day. Thank you and bye bye. Thank you.